God said to Jeremiah, also seek the peace and prosperity of the city to which I've carried you into exile. Pray to the Lord for it, because if it prospers, you will prosper too. So I don't want you to put your hands up, but how many of us have ever felt we are somewhere we really didn't plan to be? Sometimes in life we think, why am I in this job? How did I even get this job? I never trained to do this, but here I am. And sometimes it feels like an exile. And yet God says, if you will pray for the prosperity of that place, if you will have the right attitude there, it will prosper. And because of that, you'll prosper. And so we need to not be complaining and gurning, to use an Irish word, but we need to be saying, well, God, how can I be a blessing in this place? Because then I'm going to be blessed if I bless this place. And so God's in charge. He places and plants, not always where we expect. But sometimes there's a reason for it. Sometimes you are somewhere because God has you there for a reason. And you might be there just for a short time. You may not even know the reason to later on or even in eternity. But if we trust God that he's leading us, that he's sovereign, that he's planning our lives Even if we make wrong decisions, he can turn that into something positive. And so sometimes we're somewhere for a reason. Sometimes we're somewhere for a season because God brings us somewhere. It feels as if he even blows us into a situation because we bring stability there. We bring an answer there. We maybe don't realize that at the time, but maybe as we're there, we begin to see, wow, I can see why God has had me here for this season. Sometimes we're there for life. But we need to be sensitive to these things. We looked at Psalm Psalm 92. It says that when we're planted in the house, we'll flourish in the courts of our God. And we saw that that word courts actually means village. Uh, And so it's not just in the courts of God, not just in the house of God, but it's in the village. It's where we live. It's in the global village. It's where we do our business. And sometimes as church people, we have focused everybody's attention on church and in church ministry. But as we said last time, we actually, we have 168 hours in a week and probably five of them, if you're really super duper Christian or spent in church, they're one, two hours a month if you're not such a super duper Christian. But loads of hours are spent in the workplace or in other environments or with the family. And so God wants us to bloom in those environments and we can be a voice of God and we can be an influence there. We looked at the two examples that he used. He couldn't, God, even God couldn't find one tree to describe what a blooming Christian's like. <laughs> and so he uses two examples, the cedars of La- Lebanon, which are stately and tall. They were the pillars in Solomon's temple. He uses the date palm, which is fruitful, which shadows other uh, trees so that they can grow. It can bend with the wind. It can reach, bend right over and touch its toes and just shoot back up again. It creates stability in the shifting sands where it's planted. God says, that's what you're like. That's what you're like if you're planted in, in my house. You then will flourish in all these other environments. So that's a little summary. We looked at Joseph. We saw that Joseph He just flourished wherever, if he was in a pit, if he was in a prison, if he was somewhere else, he flourished in all those places. So we're going to look at some little pointers today, eight little quick points that hopefully will help us to bloom where we're planted. This will work in church, it will work in our families, it'll work in a business arena, it'll work in the environments that we we work in, because truth is truth in every environment, isn't it? Truth doesn't have to have a verse tagged onto it to make it truth. It's just truth. We put the verses on it. But truth is truth. And so if you go on to uh, the number one, yes, inspired. So we need to be inspired. So whether we're in church, whether we're in working in a, in a factory, whether we're at school, whether we're involved in some community group or charity group or whatever it is, if you're inspired, you have you have, you're a person of influence. It makes a big difference. You're going to bloom there. The word inspire means to be animated and aroused by the Spirit to do something. So what does the verse say? This is the story of Nehemiah. It said, Nehemiah said, God inspired me to assemble the people and their leaders and officials and to check their family records. I located the records of those who had first returned from captivity, and this is the information I found. Then we know that he gathered them all together. He went on to rebuild the walls of Jerusalem, and they rebuilt 
these destroyed walls in was it 57 days, all you theologians. But he said, God inspired him. But, you know, I've been a Christian now for 40 years, and I've listened to people tell me God inspired them and God spoke to them. And they're still sitting. I'm not supposed to step down here because I'm out of the light of the camera. But they're still sitting telling me how they're inspired and they never do anything about it. Some people are inspired for me to do the work. The number of people who come to me over the years in different church environments and different environments tell me, God just spoke to me. I had a dream. I think I have a prophetic word. God said, you should do such and such a thing. I'm saying, no, God said, you should do such and such a thing. He was inspired to do the work. He was inspired. Now, he got other people to help him, but he just didn't sit back and do nothing about it. And so if we're going to be inspirational people, we need to be doers. We need to be servers. We need to be workers. You see, we're, they're, people of God are workers. They're not you know, sitting telling everybody else what to do. So God inspired me to assemble the people. And so this inspiration caused him to act on the inspiration. And so wherever we are, whether it's in a church environment, a work environment, act, have an inspiration, act on it. If it's in a work environment, this is the quickest way to get promotion and more money in your pay packet. Quicker than prayer. Probably even quicker than tithing, but tithe, tithe and give. I remember these principles as a 16-year-old, the principles we're going to talk about today. I didn't have them in a format like this, but I practiced them. And so I started working the Denadri Inn as a 16-year-old rode to work on a bicycle. Kids always just say, oh, Daddy, tell us when you rode to work on a bicycle. And uh, <coughs> mockers. But I was earning the princely sum of £10 a week. Within a few months, they came and said, we've been watching you. Thankfully, it wasn't stealing anything or doing something wrong or doing all the things that the other guys... We've been watching you. We're actually going to put your salary up to £15 a week. That was a 50% increase. Now, it doesn't sound a lot. It was only a fiver, but a fiver was a lot in the 1800s. <laughs> <laughs> Swabic was telling me to them like a child of the 70s with my Paisley shirt and my corduroy. And the, anyway, <clears throat> sort of a schizophrenic a bit here with all this. Anyway, but if we put these principles into action, people notice, people, people want people that operate in these principles we're going to look at this morning. So be someone who's inspired. Don't be, eh, Monday morning again. Bounce into work. Bounce into the environment you're in. Excited and inspired because you'll inspire other people. Second one, you see, you'll have influence. We, we are called to be influencers. What did Jesus say? You're salt. Does salt influence the taste of your food? I keep telling Mary. Please put the salt in at the beginning of the cooking, not afterwards, because it's much easier to season and influence your potatoes and your carrots when you put it in. 35 years, she remembers every now and again. But anyway, we're called to influence, just like that salt, just like that light. If you go into a dark room and you put a light on, what happens? The light influences the darkness. And so we are called to be people of influence. But you'll never be a person of influence if you're not inspired because who wants to follow an uninspiring person? Who wants to listen to an uninspiring person? And so influence means the capacity or power of persons to be a compelling force on or producing effects on the actions, behavior, and opinions of others. That's what we do when we preach. We're, we're wanting to have influence, influence for good. But each one of us can have influence for good in the environments where God has planted us. Luke 14 says this in the, in the New Century Version. In the same way, you must give up everything you have to be my follower, but don't lose your influence. And so Peter and these guys, they were influential people. They were business people. They were now following the Lord, but the Lord didn't want them to lose their influence. We, we don't check our, our influence in at the door when we start following Jesus. We don't check our intellect at the door when we start following Jesus. We need to continue. Uh, there, are a lot of there are lots of people of influence who are not Christians. You ever notice that? But we actually are the people who are called to be influencers. We're actually called to be salt and light in a dark world. 
And so we should be people of influence. We also need to be people of initiative. Initiative means a readiness and an ability in initiate, initiating action or being enterprising. I run business as well. We pastor church. We are always looking for people who have initiative. People with initiative are like hen's teeth. They're scarce. People with initiative, I don't know whether we've been brainwashed by the government or whether it's the education system. Uh, Rachel was just telling us about some of the programs she's doing with the underprivileged in South Africa. They've no life skills. They don't know to. Sh- they don't even know to have initiative. Uh, and so we need to be people of initiative. We need to be people who understand. Hold on, nobody's going to do it if I don't do it. If everybody's waiting for somebody else to do it, you know what's going to get done? So Joe had an initiative. Let's start a bowls club. What, did, what was the first thing he did? He gathered a group of people. Then he went and got a mat. Then we gathered bowls. Think, well, that's rather, that's not a great example. That's very simple. Well, if he hadn't shown the initiative, I wouldn't have won 12 out of the 14 games that we have had so far. <laughs> Initiative is not complicated. Sometimes we think, oh, initiative, that's for the big clever people, for the people that have degrees. And listen, we all can show initiative. We need to be people. God wants us to be people of initiative. Look what Second Corinthians Paul said of Titus. For Titus not only welcomed our appeal, it was to do with raising finances for the church, but he is coming to you with much enthusiasm and on his own initiative. It's much easier to steer a moving car than a parked one. There's a little example of initiative. I would rather have someone that has initiative and maybe he's getting a bit too enthusiastic. I can steer that. I can come alongside and say, well, look, this is fantastic. How can we prove it? How can we tweak it? How can we align it? In your environments, in your home environment, maybe with your family, maybe with your kids, Maybe your kids are wayward. Maybe you're going to have to take some initiatives to just bring them back into line. It's not enough to say, well, I'm praying about them. No, no, we, we, sometimes we have to take the initiative. It's not taking the initiative, you can't do this and you can't do that and you can't do the other thing. The initiative is, is John always quotes, John Heenan always quotes this verse, train up a, a, a child in the way that it should go and it will not depart from it. But the verse, John, what's the, the version of the verse? Can you shout it out loud for the camera? Can you remember it? Yes. Train it up in its natural bent. So what's its gifting? What's its purpose? What is the child good at? Because if you train it up in its natural bent, then it's not going to depart from that. And so sometimes we're trying to squeeze our children because we've been taught a certain way or we've been brought up a certain way. We're trying to squeeze them into a mold that they were never made for. And sometimes we're going to have to have some new initiative. Sometimes we're going to have to look at taking, about being enterprising, whether it's with our kids, whether it's in the workplace, wherever it is, be people of initiative. Interested. I love this one. Now, this doesn't give us a license to be nosy. Philippians says this, do not be interested only in your own life, but be interested in the lives of others. My mother, who passed a few weeks ago, uh, always used to say, well, what about such and such a person? What about such and such a person? And uh, I said, well, mom, I can't tell you that about those persons because I'm, I'm the pastor. That's pre- oh, but I'm your mother. <laughs> <So that laughs> <laughs> I'm just interested <laughs> in that person. Uh, and so that's good, but sometimes interest can take one or two steps too many, and then that can just be being a busy buzzy or being nosy, or I'm not saying that about my mum, but I'm just using that as an example. And, and so we need to be interested about what's happening around us without poking our nose in people's business. They're two very different things. So don't go away and say, well, the pastor gave us license to poke our nose in people's business. But Philippians does say, do not be interested only in your own lives, but be interested in the lives of others. I've said, have an extra mile mentality. Know more than you need to know about your part 
about your situation, also know the parts that connect to your part. So do you ever, I'm going to get on another hobby horse here, do you ever go into a place, you go to the bank or you go to a shop or you go to get something fixed and you say to the person, uh, there's a phraseology in, in South Africa where if you go and ask somebody something, they say, not my job. <laughs> Have you ever heard that? <laughs> not my job. We have it here. We just say it with a different accent. Well, that's not my department. Oh, I don't know. I only look after this little box. Having been a businessman for many years, what I discovered is if I had people who worked for me who were maybe really good in this area, but they could do this area, they could do a good job in this area, and they could also cover this area because they understood how they all linked together. If someone needed to be fired, it wasn't them. If someone was going to lose their job, it wasn't them because they, they were invaluable because they were people who were interested. They were people who looked beyond their little box to, well, how does this box connect to this box? And how does this box connect to this box? And how are they all connected together? Because if I can understand that in a business setting, I can, I can grow in this business. I can move to the next level in this business. The same principle applies in our families, in church, in in different things that we're involved in and groups that we're involved in. We need to be interested. We need to have the extra mind mentality because if we, if we do, God is then going to be able to say, I can use that person in that situation. That person is becoming invaluable to me. And so, so I remember a situation where I was involved with a, a charity and they'd brought a guy in to do the interiors of a new building. And so I asked him a question. I said, that's great, uh, you're doing a good job and thank you for what you're doing. Could you give us an, a good idea on the type of floor covering that you would suggest uh, that we should use in this building with this amount of foot traffic coming through? I said, oh, that, that, that's not my department. Well, I said, you've been doing this job for 30 years. You're probably in a new building every day. You've probably seen all types of floor, co floor coverings things that work and things that don't work, could you take a guess? Could you give me a guess? Because I said, that is pathetic that you're telling that. So I had to actually remember I was a Christian. <laughs> I thought, what a clampet. I don't know if you're allowed to say that in World Wide Web, but I thought to myself, this guy's not interested at all in anything apart from his little box and his little square. And listen, many times we're the same. But God says we need to be people who are interested. We need not only to be interested in our own lives. We have a saying in Northern Ireland, us four and no more. Listen, there's a world dying. There's 90,000 people, probably out of the 100,000 people that are in our city are going to hell. We need to be interested in more than us four and no more. And that works in every area of life. If you want to grow in your business, if you want to grow in your career, you start taking an interest in a broader area than the area you're in. You're going to find you're going to get promotion beyond your, your colleagues. You're going to get promotion first because you're going to be noticed. Number five, be innovative, be an ideas person. Nehemiah again. It says, then God put the idea into my head. Sometimes we're looking for some flash of, of inspiration. Sometimes we're looking for the, to be written in the stars. Sometimes we're looking for dreams. But Nehemiah just said, God put an idea in my head. Has God ever put an idea in your head? Have you acted on it? Nehemiah, God gave him an idea, but he acted on it. And when we read the story of the rebuilding of the walls in that season in Israel's life, it was totally amazing. But he could have said, God, that was a great idea. wonder who's going to do that. But he stepped up. To be an ideas person, to be innovative, means to introduce something new or different, creative and inventive, something that's a new concept, something that's a new design. I saw a program a while back... <clears throat> And this company uh, were spending an awful lot on their, their power, electricity, gas type of thing. And they, they said there was a prize, I think, for of 50,000 pounds for the person that could come up with a savings of up to 5%. And they, 
the figures were mega figures. And so they had lots of different people respond to that. Now, they responded because there was a £50,000 prize. What was to stop those people responding before that? We say, well, I'm not creative. I would say I'm not creative. I'm not a creative person. But if you put 50 grand on the table, I could have a go at it. <laughs> Andy's a painter. I can't paint. We put 50 grand on the table. It might be that sort of abstract art, but uh, it can be worth a lot of money. Be innovative. Be an ideas person. Be in the workplace. Be in your group. Be in church. Say, here's a great idea. This would save us money. Why don't we switch the lights off after we go out of the room? Or we put those lights in that switch themselves off. You know, something's just very simple. You could come up with an idea because you're actually working there. You're seeing systems in your workplace. You're seeing things in your family. We're doing things on a daily basis. I'm sure often we thought, we could do that better. Well, have the idea, but go to the boss and tell them or tell the right person. Don't tell the person sitting in the desk beside you who's not interested. Tell the person who can make a difference, who can make a change. And so God, God we are made in God's image. Is God creative? Is he innovative? Does he have ideas? Wow. Well, so do we. And, and so often we... So is it half a, half a million sperm that are released to fertilize one egg? Where's the doctors in the house? So God said, I, I will spend half a million, there's half a million potentials just to get one. So people say, oh, well, it's a once in a lifetime opportunity. Duh. You are a one in 500,000 opportunity. And God said, that's, there's the, so God gives us so many ideas, but many times we don't get them. Many times we're not listening. Many times we're not thinking because we've been conditioned because, as Emilio told us last week, somebody said we were stupid in school or whatever it was. Don't allow, don't allow those things to stop you. You know, we just look at the different things that are happening here. Look at Erica and her craft ability. Just amazing to see how she's releasing people. You know, we have people coming to those classes that are suicidal, that are, are all sorts of problems, and they're just finding, people are saying, we just found a home here. We're just finding a place to be. Because somebody stepped up and had an idea, was creative, was innovative, used their gifting in the house, outside of the house, because it's one of our community programs. So don't, don't let what people have said about you hinder you from using the ideas that God God is putting ideas into your head. They may seem far-fetched. So God put the idea into my head, plant a church in Lisburn. Well, I can say, Lord, I'm a fish and chip man, which I was at the time. But I knew it was a, a God idea, so then I had to follow it through. So be innovative. Allow God to put those things in your head. I love John Heenan, just to mention him again. Sometimes I ask John, look, he's, he's involved in logistics. I need to get an item from a cup of tea from the top of Kilimanjaro in a cup, and I need to get it back to Lisbon and still have it hot. John said, no problem, I'll do that for you. Well, how are you going to do it? No idea, but we'll work it out. I'll come up with a creative, innovative way of doing it, and that's a bit far-fetched, obviously, but that's the sort of person that we need to be. We need to not make excuses. Well, I couldn't do that. Let, well, nobody has ever done that before. Well, you might be the first person. You might be famous. You might get a Nobel Peace Prize. I go to the solicitors and I go to all these people and they say, no one's ever asked us that before. <laughs> it must have happened a hundred times to me in the business life. Nobody has ever asked us, could we do that before or uh, asked well, what's wrong with people? That's the first question should be on their lips. But people are, people, I know we're sheep, but we need to be blue ribbon sheep, not don't be sheep. <laughs> Sorry. Well, not really. Anyway, number six. <laughs> what time is it? Okay, time's gone. Integrity. 
listen, it's great having all these other things, but we need to be people of integrity because integrity is the quality of something. It's the adherence to moral and ethical principles. It's soundness of moral character. It's honesty. It's that steel that runs through our backbone. It's that thing that when we do have a great idea and everybody thinks we're wonderful and we'll win a Nobel Peace Prize or whatever it is, uh, we're still just normal and humble and getting on with their lives. It doesn't destroy us. Uh, and so we see so many examples of that in the, in the scriptures. What does it say in Matthew 5? You therefore must be perfect, growing into complete maturity of godliness in mind and character, having reached the proper height of virtue and integrity as your heavenly Father is perfect. So integrity is such an important thing. We've often heard the saying, don't let your gift take you where your character can't keep you. And I've often seen, I've been in ministry a long time now, a Christian a long time, it's never a person's gifting that is the problem. It's usually this. And so people grow in a gifting, they get a little bit of fame, they get a little bit of coverage, they write a book, they do whatever they do. But if your integrity is not the foundation of your life, the enemy is going to catch you out somewhere. And so integrity is such an important thing. Because people will trust you. If you're a person in the workplace who doesn't bring the paper clips home, who doesn't steal the pencils, people will trust you for bigger stuff. They may not say it, but people are watching us. And if people are saying, that person's so straight, they wouldn't even take a sheet of paper home. I could trust them with my life. Amen? Obviously, it's gone very quiet. Some of you are obviously taking paper clips home. <laughs> Buy a box and bring them back in. And enthusiasm. <laughs> enthusiasm. The word enthusiasm is entheos. What does that mean? God inside. <laughs> Isn't that amazing? We think enthusiasm, that's a bit fluffy and a bit bubbly and a bit unscriptural and a bit not very godly. Actually, enthusiasm means God inside, and theos. Isn't that amazing? And so we want to be people who have God inside. We want to be enthusiastic. If I get up here and give this sermon and say, I'm going to talk about enthusiasm. Life's a difficult. But we need to be enthusiastic. Would you be inspired by that? Like Father Ted, you ever see Father Ted? They were looking for the most boring voice. If I said, we want to be enthusiastic in the most boring voice that I could put on, we wouldn't be very enthusiastic, would we? But if I'm enthusiastic, you think, this guy actually believes this stuff. This guy practices what he preaches, I hope. Um, you know, it's been interesting just to, to have conversation with people. As you, as you know, two weeks ago, we had a wedding, then my mum's uh, celebration service, and then a wedding. And people said to me, how did that work? You just went on, your family went on as normal. You married somebody, you buried your mother, you married somebody, and again, and you went, because we're enthusiastic. We believe this stuff. This is how life works. If we trust God, if God is at the center of our lives, if the people that we're burying love the Lord, they're, they're, they have stepped into a new season called eternity. And, and so, Yes, we miss them, I understand that. Yes, we have our moments, but this stuff has to work in these times in life. And so we, we had a very enthusiastic celebration service for my mom. People came up at the end and said, that was a great service. Am I allowed to say that? Really enjoyed that service. Uh, and people said, if your mom would have been here, she would have loved that. And she loved the worship. She loved the drums. She loved the enthusiasm of people, the people of God being together, worshiping God. And so we need to be enthusiastic people. It means a lively interest or eagerness. It means a passion. Look at what Paul said. Your enthusiasm has stirred most of them to action. I love how it says it has stirred most of them to action. There's always one, isn't there? For goodness sake. I wonder <laughs> most of them. So say there's a hundred people here this morning just as a round figure. I wonder how many the most of them is. Is the most of them 90% or 80%? What percentage are you in? 
Are you in the 10% or the 90% or the 20 or the 80? It stirred most of them. You ever see those people? I see it sometimes as because I'm a platform person and those in the platform. You're not going to bless me. <laughs> this is not going to make any difference to my life. Preach your hardest. I better stop. I'm going, I'm going down too many, digging too many holes here. Um, your enthusiasm has stirred most of them to action. Here's the good news and the bad news is whether you're in your workplace or in your family or in whatever you're involved in, if you put these things into practice, if you are enthusiastic, most of them will be stirred to action. There'll always be a few. Listen. They just have to let them be because it's down to choice. When you're enthusiastic, when you're an influencer, when you're coming up with the ideas, there are people will run with it. Like with Nehemiah, there's people who ran with Nehemiah, who built the walls, and then there are those who chirped on the sidelines. You know, look at that wall of a fox ran up. Oh, that was fall down. Duh. Those people need a good kicking. (laughs) In the Lord. So that's just a joke. (laughs) <laughs> Ish. But those people are really annoying, aren't they? <laughs> like, for goodness sake, we're trying our best here. But anyway, listen, there's nothing wrong with not being enthusiastic in one sense. If there's something you're not enthusiastic, but you say, but I can help fix that, that's different. So we don't mind people come and saying, mm, well, such and such and such and such. But if they also come with a solution, I love people with solutions. And so people who are enthusiastic, they may not always agree with everything that's happened, but they'll come to try and make the thing better. They'll come with a solution. And so let's be solution people. Let's be people who come with answers and not just think, no, we'll see how this works out. Fox jumps up on it, will fall down. And the last one. Excellence. We want to be people of excellence, not perfectionism. Perfectionism is putting those seats out straight and not being happy with it. Excellence. (laughs) Excellence is putting them out straight and being content that you've done your best. (laughs) So, you know, sometimes, so someone who's a perfectionist is never happy. They're never satisfied. But excellence is doing the best you can with what you have. And so if we do that, if we're people of excellence, it means a state or quality of excelling or being exceptionally good. Then this Daniel, talking about Daniel, then this Daniel was preferred above the presidents and the princes because an excellent spirit was in him. And the king thought to set him over the whole realm. We need to be people who have an excellent spirit. I know it doesn't begin with an I, along with enthusiasm, but they were too good to leave out. And uh, so, uh, you see, that's perfectionism. Wouldn't have allowed me to finish with two E's. But excellence would. Just for those of you who think I'm over the top. <laughs> but he was preferred because, he, because of all these other things also that were in his life. Here's the interesting thing about Daniel. Daniel lived through four regime changes. Quite incredible, in exile. So he wasn't in his home country. He was one of these people that Jeremiah said, when you're in exile, you pray for the prosperity of the place because you'll prosper. He believed that. He put that into practice. Maybe the band will come just as I'm I'm finishing uh, this little bit. Uh, And so he, people came and people went. Put that into your job environment. Put that into different environments that you find. You've maybe discovered this already. God maybe has you somewhere to be the stabilizer. God maybe has you somewhere to be the pillar. Daniel lived through four regime uh, changes. They came, they went. Daniel was the, was the person who remained. And so sometimes for us, if we will be people who put these things into practice, if we will be people of integrity, if we will be people who, who just walk with God, God will cause us to be promoted. He will cause us to bloom where we're planted. No matter what's going on around us, we will be the stable asset at that time. Look what it says. He was preferred. Go on just to the last one. 
he was pref uh, preferred, to, it means to put forward or advance in rank or office, to promote, to be, pre to be preferred for advancement. The Hebrew meaning is to be perpetual and permanent. And that's actually what happened with Daniel. He was perpetual, he was permanent. No matter what else happened around him, he was the rock. And so God calls us to bloom where we're planted because there are things happening in people's lives and people need stability. People need the person they can talk to. People need the rock in a, whether it's a football club or whether it's a business or whether it's a church. There needs to be people there who are like the cedars of Lebanon. They're the people they need to be like the date palm. They're the pillars. They're the people who bring fruitfulness, who bring shelter. And so just as we share communion together now in the band, just play in the background. Let's just even make a covenant with God this morning. Say, Lord, I want to be a Daniel. I want to be a person who blooms where you've planted me. Lord, we thank you that you were planted in the ground so that you could bloom in resurrection power. And Father, as we celebrate communion, just in these few moments, Father, we, we thank you for this bread. We thank you for this wine. It represents your broken body and your shed blood. And Lord, you said, except a corn of wheat fall into the ground and die, it abides alone. And so, Father, for us, we're like those seeds. And so, Father, wherever you have planted us, Lord, may our aspirations die. May our aspirations and plans be put to one side so that your aspirations and plans for us in those settings, Lord, those areas where you want us to bloom and be fruitful come to pass. Lord, we thank you for forgiving our sins. We thank you that you've dealt with our sin past, present, and future. Lord, we confess those things where we've let you down. We confess our sin. We confess the things that we should have said and we didn't say. And Lord, we, we just place them afresh under your precious blood. And so, Father, we take, partake today remembering you, remembering what you've done for us. So maybe just as you're ready, come and take a piece of bread and take a little cup.